China Global Television Network. The death toll in Kenya's mudslides tragedy rises above 50. Emergency teams clear the scene of a plane crash that's left at least 27 dead in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the Arab League meets over a U.S. decision to recognize Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank. Hello and a very warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindy Mtongana in Nairobi. Also coming up this hour. The founder of Nigeria's largest private airline is charged with money laundering in the U.S. And in sports, Cote d'Ivoire aims to compete in continental and global equestrian events. We'll be going live to our CG, CGTN correspondents this hour in the DRC uh, in the capital, Kinshasa. Chris Ochambringa is standing by with an update on that plane crash in Goma. For now, though, let's start here in Kenya, where rescue and recovery efforts continue in the northwest of the country. The region suffered landslides over the weekend. More than 50 people were killed, and authorities fear the death toll could rise. Many people are believed to be trapped in the affected villages. Well, for more on this, we have on the phone with us Kendago Obadaya, the Director of, Com of Communications for West Pokot County, uh, where this disaster took place. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the line. Uh, Kendago, to begin with, just give us an update on the latest on the ground. Do we know at this stage how many people uh, are still unaccounted for? Yes, as you correctly put it, we are currently uh, trying to continue finding and searching rescue mission, trying to uh, recover more bodies. Uh, the reports on the ground indicate that more than 46 people are still missing. And uh, those that have been confirmed to have lost their lives are um, 54. Uh, those ones have been found and they've been, their bodies are being uh, transported to uh, mortuaries around uh, the neighboring counties because uh, the hospital in Kapenguria, that's the headquarters for West Pokot, uh, are now full, and we have uh, uh, tried to find other mortuaries around where we can put the bodies. Uh, the situation on the ground is delicate, so big because uh, rescue operations have been hampered by uh, the health conditions, which are continuing to worsen. Uh, it's still raining. Uh, the area is still impassable. We can't really get to uh, the points where uh, bodies are said to have been buried. Um, so that's the situation on the ground. And tell us more about uh, whether or not residents in nearby villages are in fact safe from uh, further mudslides, particularly as you say that uh, the weather continues to be a challenge. The challenge right now is where to uh, uh, keep people because we have about 10,000 people who have been displaced from their homes. And so trying to find safer places because uh, the situation is still bad on the ground. And so we've been moving people to schools that are on higher grounds where we hope that uh, 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 the landslide would not happen. And so because of these huge numbers, uh, people are still fearful. They think uh, that they are not safe enough. And we've been trying to advise them to move to other places for now as the government uh, tries to find where to relocate them to. And so the, there is actually confusion right now. People do not know what to do. People do not know whether they are safe where they are because the grounds are there at, at, uh, at the moment are continuing to get wet and uh, they just fear that they might be affected as well. And what is the weather forecast for the days ahead? We are being told that these rains might continue. Uh, we don't know how long it, it will take. The weather forecast uh, said that uh, it looks like we might have to have... Uh, to put up with the rains for uh, two, three more weeks. Uh, we do not know how long it will take thereafter, but um, because this is December, it's supposed to, we, are, we are heading to December, it's supposed to be a dry season now, uh, and yet we are experiencing rain. So we do not know how long these rains will take, but the, there is indication that we might have to just put up with the rains for a few more weeks. 
And, and this considered then, where are rescue teams at the moment uh, focusing their efforts? The efforts right now uh, are being focused to humanitarian crisis. There is a huge humanitarian crisis on the ground at the moment. People do not have food. There is no medicine. Uh, and trying to get to those places is becoming a bit difficult. There are military choppers that have made it to uh, somewhere close to the area uh, because they cannot fly over the, uh, the mountainous region. Uh, there is mist. It is so foggy. Uh, visibility is very poor, so the military choppers cannot quite get to the area. And so what they are doing right now is we are using uh, donkeys to try and ferry some of the food and non-food stuffs that have been donated by uh, the national government and the military, uh, as, lo as well as the Kenya Red Cross. We have a multi-agency uh, team on the ground tr trying to reach out to the people. But they, the focus right now really is trying to save the people who are still there, trying to find whether we can still get uh, survivors. And our hopes are really going down at the moment. Mm -hmm. It looks like the death toll will just have to rise. But uh, the focus really is trying to look with their children who are suffering, people are sick, uh, uh, they have no food. And so the focus right now is trying to secure those who are still alive mm -hmm. and uh, try to greet them with food stuff medicine and other uh, personal emoluments. Indeed, a dire situation following a devastating tragedy. Thank you so much, Kendago Obadaya, the Director of Communications for Kenya's West Pokot County. I was hit by fatal floods this weekend, leaving 54 people dead and at least 46 still missing. Now, let's go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where at least two people have survived Sunday's plane crash. A small plane crashed into homes after takeoff in the eastern city of Goma. More than 20 people were killed, including passengers and villagers on the ground. The aircraft was operated by a local company called Busy Bee. The cause of the accident is still unclear. Now, CGTN's Chris Ochombringa joins us live from Kinshasa with more on this story. Chris, has there been any statement so far from the Busy Bee airline on what could have caused this crash? Well, Busy Bee hasn't issued any statement yet, but uh, the local authorities in Goma uh, believe that the, cra the cause of the crash was a mechanical problem. Now, there are experts who are conducting investigations currently, and they have promised to issue a statement. Immediately, they uh, establish all the facts. Lindy? Now, we know that uh, the death toll as of last night was uh, 27. Has there been any change to that figure, and has everyone uh, been accounted for? Yes, uh, the, the provincial government in Goma said that uh, the death toll has risen to 29. Uh, this is uh, after, you know, the passenger plane which had 17 people and two crew members, you know, crashed in a very busy uh, residential area. And they have also told us that there are 16 people who are currently receiving treatment at hospital. That is the latest information we have got so far from Goma. Mm. And having crashed in a busy residential area, uh, how are authorities planning to help the victims' families and those whose homes were affected? Well, the authorities there have, uh, first of all, issued condolences to the families, the relatives of those people who lost their loved ones. And they have also said that they will meet the costs of the burial of these people. It's a very sad uh, day in Goma because, you know, this accident just comes a month after a cargo plane that was transporting uh, President Felix Chisekedi's staff crashed. The, that cargo plane was also departing from Goma, the same international airport. And so people have raised concerns about uh, <clears throat> the safety of some of these commercial airliners. And actually, the European Union has banned uh, all the uh, commercial planes operating DRC from operating in their airspace. So it's a very sad moment, but <clears throat> we are waiting for more information. There's still a lot that's happening in Goma, and we will be updated later on. Well, thank you so much, Chris Ochamringa, live for us there in Kinshasa on that uh, small uh, aircraft crash in Goma that's left 29 people dead. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there.
To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Now to Libya, where the Coast Guard says they've intercepted more than 400 illegal migrants making their way to Europe. The UN says at least nine boats carrying some 600 migrants have been spotted in just the past two days. Thousands of African migrants are held in detention centers in Libya, where they live in dire conditions. The news comes at a time when fighting around Tripoli intensifies. CGTN's Adel al Makhrouri has more. In just three days, Libya's Coast Guards say they have rescued 433 illegal migrants in three different naval operations. 284 were intercepted on Wednesday after their boat sent a distress call asking for immediate help. Another boat carrying 50 migrants was detected on Friday in what appears to be a spike in the attempts to cross the Mediterranean. In this time of the year, the weather becomes unstable. Tides in the Mediterranean become stronger and navigation is much harder, so migrants' boats get into more accidents. It's a phenomenon that extends throughout the year. The third incident Libyan Coast Guards reported this weekend, a rescue mission for 99 migrants on Thursday. An African woman went into labor and gave birth during the operation. It's a strong indication to how desperate migrants in Libya want to leave. Migrants live in detention centers in tough living circumstances. It's worse than the terrible living standards Libyans are experiencing because of the civil war at home. Just recently, migrants died because of an airstrike on one detention center. The situation is expected to get worse now that Trump's administration has frozen financial support to the UN, which helps these illegal migrants. Libyan Coast Guard spokesperson says they have recently raised their state of alert to its highest Regular naval patrols roam the Mediterranean. Still, some boats manage to skip their surveillance and reach Europe. According to the United Nations, at least nine migrant boats have been intercepted off Libya's shores and a tenth has reached Italy. The UN has continuously warned about the abuses migrants face in Libya's detention centers, which are mostly controlled by militias. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Now, Arab League ministers will hold an emergency meeting on Washington's decision to change its policy on Israel's settlements in the West Bank. Last week, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the White House no longer sees the settlements as inherently illegal. This is a breakaway from a decades-long stance held by the American government. Israeli settlements in the Palestinian-occupied territories have been a source of tension. Several countries have voiced opposition to the U.S. move, including South Africa. Well, let's bring you more on this now. We're joined by CGTN's Stephanie Freed uh, in Tel Aviv. Stephanie, to begin with, has the U.S. decision in a, in, a, in a stance, in a policy stance, has it had any impact on the ground in the West Bank? And how has Israel responded to the Arab League's decision to hold an emergency meeting on this topic? Uh, well, first of all, the, the Israel doesn't generally uh, respond to Arab League meetings um, unless uh, monumental decisions come out or announcements come out. Even then, Israel's very hesitant to uh, to respond to meetings or the outcomes of those meetings. Um, in terms of on the ground, not yet has there been anything concrete that's seen beyond protests, anger. The Palestinian Authority has issued very angry statements. Um, and certainly on the ground, this is another cause for tension, another movement in the direction of creating tension and volatility, and a peace process between Israel and um, the Palestinians, which has been 
stuck for a decade plus, um, that the U.S. says it wants to kickstart and get moving with a deal of the century that we have yet to see that the Trump administration says it will present. Now, this is not going to do anything to push any sort of peace or movement of the sides toward each other. Um, so the announcement isn't having positive effects. Israel was certainly happy about that announcement. The uh, Israeli government that's in place at the moment, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, but that's basically in a nutshell the response or non-response as well on the ground as well to the uh, emergency meeting of the Arab League. And Stephanie, you mentioned of course that the news was pleasing to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, this of course as he battles allegations of corruption, some suggesting that this is a welcome distraction for him. Welcome distraction in the sense that it was widely understood that this announcement and the timing of this announcement on the part of, a, of the White House was meant to bolster Benjamin Netanyahu at a time where he's fighting for his political survival. His right wing voters and that constituency, which we saw a drop in a previous election in his support, a slight drop. Uh, this would be something that would bolster his popularity among right-wing voters. And that was widely understood, that, that the, the White House, in a sense, was giving him or propping Benjamin Netanyahu up on some level. So yes, it was welcome news. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu called it a historic day for the state of Israel, for the people of Israel. Uh, the international community says it's it's not uh, it's illegal. Israel's uh, settlement policy is illegal, and that's according to UN resolutions and international law. So the U.S. announcement, how much of an effect will it have in the long term? It depends on how far Israel d decides to take that sort of legitimization mm -hmm. to move forward, uh, take over more parts of the West Bank, and even there's a, a, a fear that there will be annexation. Stephanie Freed, thank you so much for that. Joining us there live in Tel Aviv. You are watching Africa Live. More news after the break. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? or what you make happen for yourself. If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live, find your voice. Africa Live, find your voice. The 6th District Council elections of China's Hong Kong Special Administrative Region have concluded. The Electoral Affairs Commission says all 452 seats in 18 districts have now been elected. District councils chiefly oversee community-level tasks, and this election was the first citywide vote since the scrapping of a controversial fugitive bill which sparked the ongoing unrest. The protests have divided society and damaged Hong Kong's economy. It's also seriously disrupted the election process. Many pro-establishment candidates were hindered on election day. Now, in Tokyo, on the sidelines of a high-level meeting, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi was asked about his thoughts on the district council elections in Hong Kong. He said results were still unofficial, but the region's status would stay the same, regardless of the outcome. No matter what happens in Hong Kong, it's a part of Chinese territory. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China, and any attempt to destabilize Hong Kong, or even damage its stability and prosperity, will not succeed. Following weeks of violence, vote counting has begun in Guinea-Bissau's presidential poll. President José Mario Vaz faced off against 11 other candidates. His toughest competitor is former Prime Minister Domingo Simoes Pereira. Experts see the election as a test for the country, which has witnessed nine coups or attempted coups since independence. Vaz is on track to become the country's first elected president to complete a full term. 
Preliminary results are expected on Thursday. If no candidate secures more than half the votes, a second round of voting will take place in late December. Now, for some perspective on the Guinea-Bissau elections, we're joined live by Achike Chude, an African affairs and policy analyst from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time, Achike. The polls in Guinea-Bissau closed without incident. Do you see this election perhaps ending the political turmoil that Guinea-Bissau has seen since independence? Uh, no, it's going to take more than um, one election, uh, this election specifically to end uh, years of uh, political turmoil. Uh, it takes much more than that. But I would say that perhaps uh, the ground, the, the foundation has been laid. And that is the fact that um, uh, this election has ended relatively peacefully. And so uh, it's a sign uh, that if it is built upon, uh, then, you know, by the politicians, especially uh, the person who is going to benefit from uh, the election itself, the person who is going to emerge as uh, the president of uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, will be in a position to build upon uh, the peaceful uh, turnout of this election. And one other thing again, you know, um, the, the votes, I mean, are still ongoing, uh, but uh, the counting are still ongoing. But um, it is also important that uh, there is a sense, a general sense of uh, belief that this election has been run properly, run well, and that, uh, that, um, uh, and that votes or the votes of the people have not been manipulated. So once there is this general mindset about how well the election was run, it becomes very difficult uh, for troublemakers to want to uh, you know, cast as passion on the credibility of the election and subsequently cause problems. But like I said, I think the critical person uh, that can continue along this path mm -hmm. is the person who wins, uh, who comes out uh, in tops as, uh, mm -hmm. as a winner of this election. He can only build on the peaceful process that uh, has characterized this election. And of course, as you say, the, the person who wins this election has an important and very big job to do, particularly considering the tumultuous political history of this country. Have been removed by, by the military. So stability is key. And then a lot of the candidates, and I want to believe uh, the person that wins this election again, uh, they have been talking about uh, infrastructure. They have been talking about uh, you know, uh, making the socioeconomic dynamics much better uh, because of the grinding you know, level of poverty in Guinea-Bissau. About 70% of uh, citizens of uh, Guinea-Bissau are living below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so this is it's a country that has emerged in all kinds of economic uh, and social uh, crisis. So I want to believe that this will be the priority of uh, whoever it is that uh, takes over. And then again, uh, the issue of, um, of uh, the, the drug trade. Uh, I, I think Guinea-Bissau has been designated uh, the first narco African state uh, in, in Africa. And uh, that is um, not a very good uh, baggage yeah, to want to carry. And I think uh, it was uh, the present uh, president um, uh, sometime in February or so that had, while receiving members of the United Nations Security Council, had talked about uh, the fact that uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, you know, uh, 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 that Guinea-Bissau needed uh, a lot of help, you know, to combat uh, the drug cartels that are now using the very complex uh, sea coast of Guinea-Bissau Guinea as uh, uh, trading uh, points for their drug trade. Mm -hmm. They don't have boats, they don't have a radar, they don't have so many of that. So you're talking about a country that is weak institutionally mm -hmm. and a country that, uh, that has all kinds of um, areas of social political problems. Uh, so these are, I think, I believe, some of the priorities also. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Achike Chude, an African affairs and policy analyst speaking to us there live from Lagos, Nigeria. Now let's turn to Somalia, where authorities are debating an electoral model for the 2020 and 2021 polls. Security remains a major concern, but authorities are expressing optimism over the possibility of one-man, one-vote elections. CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilo explains from Mogadishu. Officials in Somalia say they remain committed to ensuring universal suffrage is realized with less than a year to the next election cycle. If agreed upon, this will be the first popular vote to be conducted in the country for the first time in 50 years. Meanwhile, more political parties continue to receive official accreditation from the Registrar of Political Parties, as the country hopes to transition from clan-based politics to a more inclusive multi-party system. So far, 57 political party has temporarily registered. Moreover, the Somali public support the one person, one vote because they believe it is the only mechanism that marginalized groups can regain their rights to take part in the political decision-making process. 
The debate over the electoral model for the upcoming elections continues to dominate headlines in the country. A 15-member committee drawn from parliament has been tasked with coming up with a draft electoral law. Opposition politicians, including two former presidents, recently met with President Mohamed Abdullah Farmajo to discuss the upcoming elections. We've agreed that the polls will take place as planned and there will be no extension of the mandate to all arms of the government. All elected officials must seek a fresh mandate after the end of their official term. The nature and type of election is still open to debate, but rest assured, we've talked with the president and an official election plan agreed upon by all concerned parties that are set to take part. As well as the United Nations top diplomat to Somalia, James Swan, says that political consensus remains vital ahead of upcoming polls. Progress on the ambitious agenda for 2020 will require a high degree of political consensus. This will entail dialogue and compromise between the central government and federal member states, between the executive and legislature, between current office holders and those now out of power, and between elite leaders and those community elders, civil society organizations, women's and youth groups who give voice to so many Somalis. Opposition politicians have merged various political parties into one major coalition aimed at challenging the current administration. Both President Mohamed Abdullah Farmajo and his Prime Minister Hassan Ali Qaire are yet to announce their political strategy for the next elections or whether they plan to create a united front or go separate ways as witnessed in previous elections. Abdul Aziz Bilal, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. The government of Niger has announced plans to change the country's national anthem. Among the changes is the removal of references to former colonial power France. As CGTN's Daniel Plafka reports, the state wants to introduce a new anthem to serve as a patriotic war cry. A committee composed of government officials and experts met with Niger's president, Mohamedou Issoufou, in late November. The committee's objective is to reflect and correct the words of the country's national anthem. The expected outcome is an anthem that reflects the patriotic side of the Nigerian people. We had no less than seven proposed anthems from across the country, so we want it to be a participatory, inclusive program, because changing a national anthem is a citizen's agenda. The proposal has been widely welcomed by locals. Some citizens have expressed displeasure with the current anthem, which makes reference to the country's former colonial master, France. But there are those who are fine with the current anthem and would prefer it be retained. For example, part of the anthem says our new freedom. Following our independence, we just had freedom. That is understandable. 61 years later, if we continue to speak of new freedom, the context is not appropriate. The parts, stand up, Niger stand up, is variously appreciated. Some find it very good. Stand up and ready to fight is the idea. But others find that we were not lying down. It has been a long time since we asked that this anthem be changed. It's not in line with our story. When we say, let us be proud and grateful for our freedom, it's as if there has been no fight from Nigerians. Everyone knows that the first war in the colonial administration took place in Western Niger. The words of the current national anthem, called the Nigerienne, were written one year after independence in 1961 by French composer Albert Ferrier. But Niger is not the only country to call on French artists to compose their national anthem after gaining independence. Senegal and the Central African Republic also tapped into French talents when they gained independence in 1959 and 1960, respectively. Daniel Plafker, CGTN. South Africa is hosting the first ever joint maritime exercise with China and Russia in Cape Town. A Chinese warship arrived Sunday. It was joined by two Russian vessels. The heads of both delegations met with their South African counterpart. They were welcomed by a crowd that included the Chinese Consul General in Cape Town. 
In addition to the drill, the countries will also hold friendly football matches. Chirping of birds, sounds of whispering trees, burbling of streams. When sunlight sets the forest's leaves aglow and waterfall surges down from the mountain, we see and hear the Earth's wondrous beauty. The Earth is meant to be appreciated and the life of its inhabitants deserves our endless exploration. Come with CGTN to listen and see in Chorus of Life to marvel at nature and life. And coming up next in your business news. The founder of Nigeria's largest private airline is charged with money laundering in the U.S. And a sigh of relief in South Africa as inflation slows to the lowest level in eight years. Africa Live. Find your voice. You start your business news in Nigeria, where the chairman and founder of Air Peace has been charged with fraud and money laundering. Alan Onyema allegedly moved more than $20 million from foreign sources through American bank accounts. He's accused of using the money to pay for living expenses, luxury cars and high-end shopping. He's allegedly taken part in a scheme that involved organizations he founded, as well as false documents related to the purchase of airplanes. Onyema earned praise earlier this year after dispatching planes to offer free flights to Nigerians facing xenophobic violence in South Africa. He has denied the allegations. Meanwhile, in Somalia, direct flights between Mogadishu and Nairobi have commenced after months of tension between the two neighbors. From Mogadishu, here's CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilo with more. We have also discussed the issues about flights from Mogadishu into Nairobi because now apparently they're going through Wajir. And we have agreed that within a week, the necessary authorities should put in place that which is necessary to ensure that we now have direct flights once again from Mogadishu to Nairobi. The announcement to resume direct flights was made following a meeting between Somali President Mohamed Abdullah Fermajo and his Kenyan counterpart Uhuru Kenyatta in Nairobi. Direct flights between the two countries have once again resumed six months after it was suspended following strained relations between the two neighbors. A maritime dispute along the Indian Ocean is at the heart of a major diplomatic tiff between Mogadishu and Nairobi. 
The case is due to be heard later next year by the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Across the country, airline operators and travel agencies have welcomed the move, insisting that it will provide their clients with ample time, especially those connecting to other countries. Initially, it took our clients four to five hours between Mogadishu and Nairobi because of the mandatory stopover in Wajir. This, in turn, affected our passengers, especially those with connecting flights. The elderly and the sick also suffered as a result of lack of direct flights. Several Kenyan-owned airlines, including its national carrier, Kenya Airways, makes regular flights in and out of Mogadishu. Local Somali airlines also stand to benefit as part of the new agreement between the two countries that also ensures visa on arrival to Somali citizens. I welcome the resumption of flights between the two countries. It's going to improve movement of people. We thank both leaders for reaching this agreement. Direct flights between both countries is a step forward. Most people had issues with flights transiting in Niger. We thank the Somali government for addressing this pressing issue. Despite the resumption of direct flights between the two countries, Somalia's Ministry of Civil Aviation still requires flights from Nairobi to the port city of Kismayo to fast transit through Mogadishu before traveling to the southern port city of Kismayo. The move was put in place after a disputed election in August that saw Ahmed Mohamed Islam re-elected again as the president of the jubilant state. The regional state shares a long and porous border with Kenya. Mogadishu has accused Kenya of supporting the regional leader in Kismayo. The federal government now insists that a fresh election must now take place in Jubaland. Abdul Aziz Bilo, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. South Africa could fall deeper into junk territory after ratings firm S&P Global cut the country's credit outlook to negative. The rating agency has attributed the revised outlook to slow economic growth and mounting government debt. S&P, together with Fitch, already have South Africa in sub-investment territory, but the last of the three main ratings firms, Moody's, has left Africa's most industrialized economy teetering on the edge of junk status. Since taking over last year, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has vowed to get growth going, but progress has been slow, with gross government debt projected to surge to about 81% of the GDP by 2028. Meanwhile, South Africa's consumer inflation dropped to an eight-year low of 3.7% year-on-year in October. The decline comes as fuel prices fall sharply, raising the chance of an interest cut by the central bank. Our reporter, Sumitra Naidu, brings us up to speed. South Africa has had some good rain in recent weeks and dams are replenishing slowly. We have enough food supplies, at least from now up until April 2020. We harvested just north of 11 million tons. We still had sufficient maize to be net exporters. We're actually going to be exporting about 1.1 million tons of maize so far, regardless of a decline in planting that we have seen. We still produce more than we consume and we had sufficient stocks to help us go forward. But in just under six months, those grain supplies could run out. The rains came late, delaying the summer planting season for 2020, which means the next harvest will be off schedule. But now from April 2020 going on into 2021, that's where the concern is going to be. Production could decline, uh, but that won't necessarily take us out of the export markets. And uh, in line with the consumer side, I think that from now up until at least the end of this year, going on into April next year, I don't expect a notable increase even on a consumer price inflation. You think about the first nine months of this year, for example, when you look at South Africa's food price inflation, it averages at about 2.9%. For the year, we think it would average at levels less than 3.4%. Agricultural output has declined due to drought conditions in parts of the country near Lesotho and Namibia. Further up in Zambia, drought conditions are persisting. UN agencies have already warned that over 45 million people in southern Africa face severe food shortages in the next six months. Any time that you have an adverse weather condition and it affects the market, what happens is the demand of the product remains the same. Okay. But when the supply, in other words, the farmers can't produce more, the price will go up. So when the farmers have got good weather conditions and they've got a lot of supply, they can supply the markets, 
therefore the price will come down. Food inflation in South Africa has declined significantly over the last year, but this could very quickly change should the next harvest be insufficient. Environmental organizations have also warned that food security is at risk unless South Africa changes and corrects its unsustainable practices. Sumit Renadu, CGT at Kroenfall, South Africa. Tunisia's Ministry of Industry says nearly 250 companies will have access to capital restructuring. All the companies employ about 10,000 people. The Consultative Committee of the Support Line approved 64 applications with an investment of more than 50 million U.S. dollars. CGTN's Adnan Chouachi has more. The support line was created in 2018. It aims to secure technical support for small and medium-sized enterprises through the development of financial and economic diagnostic studies and mentoring programs with banks and financial institutions. SMEs are the pillar of the Tunisian economy. The support line is necessary to expand the research and the business activity of these enterprises that can create up to 10,000 additional jobs in the next 12 months. Experts from the Ministry of Industry and the Ministry of Finance will monitor financial restructuring programs. This support line, which runs until 2020 with an overall amount of 150 million US dollars, is expected to target 600 companies. Several government agencies will provide the technical assistance and the necessary expertise to guarantee the success of the projects. Experts maintain that Tunisia, which is known for its potential and its internationally recognized expertise, seeks to encourage entrepreneurship by supporting the private sector. Modern technology and automation require huge investments and the backing from the state. Tunisia has very skilled engineers and technicians in all fields. The financial support is boosting industry in the country. Authorities assert that SMEs with promising development prospects and seeking to expand and prosper will get support in the next three years. The Ministry of Industry aims to increase the state's lending capacity to SMEs in the capital city Tunis as well as in rural regions. High unemployment is one of the major challenges facing the Tunisian economy. Small and medium-sized enterprises provide more than 50% of the country's private sector jobs. Experts assert that SMEs still lack reliable access to long-term credit. Adnan Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis. A Chinese smartphone assembly plant has opened up in Uganda, becoming the first of its kind in the African country. Uganda says this development will likely reduce the import bill on phones from China. China was the biggest source of phone imports for Uganda last year, bringing in stock worth 30 million US dollars. CGTN's Isabel Nakiria has more. The first Ugandan made phones rolling down the assembly line. Simi Mobile at the Namavi Industrial Park outside Kampala will be producing about 500 phones daily. The plant has started with basic phones for now and will begin making smartphones and laptops in a few months. Everybody use application. So smart life already come to Africa. This is good time to invest in Africa, not on trading, on the trading, yeah, but also investor for industry, ICT industry. The company says it will go into manufacturing parts here after training Ugandans in this field. For now, mobile phone parts are being imported from China. Phone technicians here are busy putting together parts of phones that are expected to hit the market in weeks. The phones will be sold on the local markets for now and will go for as low as $15 each. Uganda's ICT ministry says the new invention is expected to boost internet speeds once the company begins producing smartphones. The more people access these devices at an affordable price, the more you will be easing connectivity. And the more these manufacturers or business people get a bigger market, the more they will be able to price their services low. The $15 million company is one of many Chinese investments in the country. The 2018 Uganda Investment Report shows China invested over $600 million, making it a top investor in the country. 
Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda. Time now for a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. A film celebrating South Africa's ANC's liberation movement traces the historic Letters Exchange program. Africa Live. Find your voice. We start in South Africa. Letters of Hope is a film that celebrates the heritage of Africa's oldest liberation movement, the African National Congress. The film is based on the historic letter exchange program, which the ANC facilitated with different countries, aiming to keep contact between families in exile and those left back home in South Africa. The film is currently being shown in Johannesburg as part of the Joburg Film Festival. CGTN's Yulisa Jamela has more. Based on a true story, Letters of Hope tells the story of a young man who's caught between his father's wishes and his own dreams. After his father was brutally killed, Jeremiah Bosman discovered that his father was a postman who delivered secret letters from exile. In a letter written by his father, Jeremiah learns that his father's last wish was for him to take over his job and deliver the letters. Jeremiah, whose dream is to become a policeman, is conflicted whether to follow his father's footsteps or to leave home. The film is written by Vusi Africa and is based on a research that was done for the ANC in one of South Africa's provinces. Mpumalanga for the party's centenary celebrations. Vusi Africa was a student at the time he embarked on the historical research. He subsequently interviewed 2,000 people who were involved in shaping the history of this country since the birth of the ANC in 1912. So there was a program started and that program was specifically designed to smuggle letters into the country. So um, we, we, we discovered the story and we discovered that the story has actually never been told. We've never heard of the story, nobody knows of the letter exchange programs, nobody knows how the people in exile kept contact with the people in South Africa. Letters of Hope is about that, it's about those letters that came into the country to bring in the hope to ensure that the people who are left in South Africa do not give up on the fight for liberation. Apiwa Mkefe is a lead actor in this film. He takes immense pride in being part of this story. I think it's quite important because, I mean, in the time that we're living in now, uh, there's a lot of, like, fickle content that's not really uh, African. You know, a lot of things are on television that become westernized. So I feel like this movie is really important because it's made by South Africans, by young, independent black filmmakers telling the story of South Africa. And that's quite rare because a lot of our stories here are told by Western influences. We, we have a responsibility to ourselves for those who came before us and also a responsibility to inspire our future. We need to create a new dream. Politicians have failed. So it's up to us as thinkers, cultural activists, as, as South Africans to tell a new dream, to come up with a new dream and inspire this nation, this great nation. So, so this film was very important for me. After showing here at the Joburg Film Festival, Letters of Hope will be in local cinemas in March 2020. Yulisa Njamela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Coming up in your sports news, up next. Cote d'Ivoire aims to compete in continental and global equestrian events. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks. In the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene. Find your game.
Horse riding in Cote d'Ivoire is mostly seen as a leisure activity, but the sport is evolving into a competitive discipline in the West African country. CGTN's Charm Gono has more. Every Sunday in Cote d'Ivoire's capital, Abidjan, groups of amateur and professional riders head to the equestrian center for a 